urgent how we how we utilize this technology and why it's important to us. Um, so the first, the next talk I was supposed to give was going to be on spinal cord, how we use this for monitoring the spine. Uh, go ahead, advance. One point. There you go. So um, we have several things available, which you're probably very familiar with. One of the the oldest and and the long long longest utilized technique is SCPs, somatosensory evoked potentials, where you stimulate on the skin and, and record at the uh, scalp level. And as you know, this monitors the back of the spinal cord. So this is a very crude and indirect way of just determining the uh, integrity of the spinal cord. And um, the newer technology, not newer, but uh, more recent would be motor evoked potentials, which is where you stimulate above and you record down below. And as you know, in the spinal cord, that's ventral in the front of the spinal cord or lateral, and the SCPs record on the back of the spinal cord. So now with the combination of both, we can get a, a more full picture uh, around the spinal cord. And this is important because, um, as you know, spinal cord injury um, is not always direct trauma. Um, a lot of it is vascular, secondary injury from vascular. And in fact, many of our cardiac thoracic surgeons, do, do your thoracic and cardiac surgeons use monitoring for their aorta surgery? Do, do they monitor? No. Some of our uh, thoracic surgeons have uh, monitoring while they clamp the aorta to work because uh, they want to watch the spinal. One of the risks is uh, a spinal cord ischemia. And with these in particular, you can see changes um, and know how long you can keep that uh, aorta cross clamp. And so uh, in, a, in the United States, we have some thoracic surgeons who will use this for difficult aortic cases. Um, so uh, you can also record directly on the spinal cord um, below the surgical site. And um, those are a little more technically challenging. I would let Bob kind of inform you how they bring out those signals a little bit better. So with these, next slide, with these modalities, um, you know, there are certain conditions that we can monitor that, that are very helpful. Uh, scoliosis correction, severe cases of scoliosis. When you're correcting a curve in the back and you're straightening the spine, you can over distract. You can get uh, changes in uh, your monitoring that tell you that you're putting um, too much stress on the spinal cord. The question as a surgeon is always, um, you know, it's tough. What am I going to do if I see a change? Is this a surgery that has to be done? Or is this a surgery where I would stop or change what I do? If there's nothing you can alter, if you're going into the spinal cord to remove a tumor and you know that the best treatment is to get that tumor completely out, is it going to matter um, whether you have a problem with your monitoring or not, or you can still continue to take that tumor out? Is it going to alter your technique? For instance, scoliosis, maybe you can do a partial correction. Maybe you don't completely straighten it. If you keep losing function, the trade-off is we're going to leave them a little bit uh, scoliotic, but I'm not going to lose function. So in some cases, you can alter what you do. Other cases, it's really not going to matter very much. And so the monitoring is not as important. Um, there's a new technology in scoliosis now. Um, who, any surgeons in here, or neurologists mostly? Are you aware of the rods that are magnetized? And they- We don't use them. Yeah. It's not it's very, very expensive. expensive. Yeah. Very expensive. They are really, they're re have you seen these rods? So you put these rods in a child, mm -hmm. and with, with a controller in the clinic, every three to four weeks, you increase the length of the rod inside the body. With, with it's, they're magnetized. And so you can correct scoliosis now slowly over months with rods that expand in the body. They're really, really interesting. But they're like $20,000 for one rod. <laughs> Very expensive. So 
When you do scoliosis correction, um, one of the risks with severe scoliosis is spinal cord injury. So it's helpful for that. Then there's external compression. So as a surgeon, this it's very helpful for this. Um, if you've got someone fell and they land on their bottom and they, their bone explodes and pushes on their spinal cord, if they have resistance function left, you can monitor while you pull bone and compression off the spinal cord. And sometimes um, it alters how you do that in surgery. For instance, if you're working from behind and you're going around the spinal cord to get bone fragments, sometimes you abandon it and you go from the front. Um, sometimes you leave a fragment, if every time you pull on it you get a change, sometimes you can leave things and go work in a different area first. So this is very helpful for anything pressing outside on the spine in helping you understand uh, as you're working, if you're working in a sensitive area, maybe you need to do a, different, a little different approach while you're in the operating room. Um, I very rarely use it. Uh, I don't monitor my disc, disc cases. I don't monitor uh, lumbar stenosis. Um, you know, there's many things that I think you can just do and they're very, very safe. But with trauma in particular, the tumors, things that are pressing on the spine, it can be very helpful um, in changing your technique while you work. Intramedullary lesions, those are things in the spinal cord, things inside the substance of the cord. Things like tumors, uh, vascular AVMs, vascular malformations. And then the cardiac surgeons will uh, sometimes monitor <coughs> when they do aorta surgery and it's very important to do motors. Whenever you're doing a case with a vascular surgeon, the SCPs on the back of the spinal cord really aren't that useful. So um, an anterior spinal cord syndrome is a vascular insult to the spinal cord and it spares your dorsal columns going up and down the back of the spine. And so SCPs may not change at all, even though you've got a patient who now became paralyzed. Go ahead, next slide. Um, so I look at it as a surgeon, I, I don't, uh, all these technical things that Dr. Skolbasi is talking about are new to me. I, you know, I don't, I don't do the monitoring. So I, um, I'm learning a lot about how they get signal and things. But for me, what's important with monitoring are some very basic, obvious principles. Number one is, is, is monitoring going to change what I do? If I have a patient who's broken their neck, and they're quadriplegic, uh, it's not going to come back, uh, depending on the kind of injury. I mean, there are cases we know going in, we're going to put rods and screws in their neck just to keep them from getting a bad posture with their neck, but it's not going to change their function. We don't need to monitor those cases. Unfortunately, they're already quadriplegic. So is it going to change what I do? Are there surgeries we do in the spine where we just have to do them anyway. Um, certain kinds of tumors um, in the spine, we have to resect them to, for survival, for patients to have survival. And sometimes the function, walking, using the restroom, bladder, bowel function, is really not our important goal. Um, we have some cases where uh, survival is very dependent on how much tumor you get out, and so you want to be very aggressive. We have other kinds of tumors where you just you don't need to get it all out. You just need to get the pressure off the spinal cord. Those are very good to monitor. So it really, just like with brain cases, it really depends on whether or not you, you can change your plan in surgery. Monitoring is live feedback. And so if it's not going to change what you do minute by minute, there's no reason to monitor and as a surgeon, you have to use your judgment whether it can be very paralyzing in surgery. When you get Dr. Bossi telling you there's a problem and you're working as a surgeon, you can just freeze and not, not know what to do. Um, and so sometimes this can be, um, it, it cannot be helpful. It can actually hurt you if, if it's not going to help um, what you do in the operating room. Okay? Sometimes we have alternate uh, plans and sometimes we don't. Um, so, do I have to proceed anyway? Epidural abscess, an infection. Infection in the spine, you've got to clean it out. 
So if I'm washing out an abscess, I never monitor. I, I've got to wash it out. You, you've got to get the abscess out. That, that's, that's a surgical disease. You treat with antibiotics, but when there's an abscess in the spine of significant size, you've got to wash it out. So I don't care what the signals say. I've got to go in and put a catheter in and wash, you know, irrigate and wash. And so I don't find it useful for things where it's a standard treatment. I have to do it. If I don't do it, there's going to be a big problem. So I don't, I don't monitor for things like this. I do monitor for external compression. Um, do I have alternates? So if something changes, is there a different plan I can take? That would be a good case to monitor. Um, are the changes reversible? Uh, tumors in the spinal cord, as you know, are very delicate. And if I get a change working inside the spinal cord, is that something that's going to come back once I see the change? There are some areas we work that are so sensitive that if we get into them and we start to lose function, it's not a technical problem like retraction or changing my approach. You've just cut through an area that's important and it's gone. So with spinal cord tumors, sometimes once the responses go, there's no technique I can change to bring them back. Um, uh, and then is the risk of surgery, for instance, routine disc surgery for sciatica, for leg pain, th there's very little risk with that surgery and the monitoring is going to add almost no benefit. It's not going to really help me in any way. So I don't use it on just routine back surgery. Uh, next slide. So I think clear indications for monitoring um, I don't know in the United States any surgeons that would do a spinal cord tumor without monitoring. We, we monitor pretty much anybody that we're operating on inside the spinal cord. And those are actually rare cases. We don't, we don't do very many spinal cord tumors, but they do have, they're, they're mostly pediatric kind of patients. Um, severe external compression, trauma, burst fractures, dislocated spines, uh, those are great cases to monitor if they have function left over, especially when you position the patient. We put the monitoring on on the gurney, and then when we move them onto the operating table, we know if we have the neck in a safe position. Um, severe scoliosis correction um, is very useful. Uh, vascular procedures, AVM, so little fistulas in the spinal cord, AVMs of the spinal cord, Many of these are treated now without open surgery. They're treated endovascular with catheters in the artery. And when you occlude and squirt uh, occlusive agents into these vessels, you can sometimes see changes. And so what you can do is you can temporarily block the vessel with a catheter or a balloon and then see if you get changes before you put something permanent in. Um, spinal dislocation, someone has a dislocated neck. Cardiothoracic um, surgery, if they're going to be working extensively, like a thoracic aortic aneurysm. Um, I, you know, this is a odontoid, a, a C2 fracture. Um, you know, the, the anatomy up high in the neck is such that there's a lot of extra room. I have, in probably, what, 17 years now, I have not seen an odontoid, a C2 fracture, with a neurologic deficit. I've never, have you ever seen a C2 fracture? A fracture, but uh, odontoidum uh, with the atlanta axial dislocation, but... Uh, but they ne they're never paralyzed. Well, well, this guy was because he had uh, at least three millimeters for the spinal cord. And oh, so he was severe. Yeah. I've never seen it. And, and one reason we may not see it is because with high cervical cord injuries, you don't breathe. So most people, when they, when they have that kind of fracture, they, they die at the scene. They, they can't breathe above C4, C5. If you sever your spinal cord, then you lose your pulmonary function. So that may be one reason. But we see these a lot um, in our elderly patients that are in care homes. They fall. They're 80 years old. They've got really brittle bones, and they snap C2. There is so much extra room that high in the neck around the spinal cord that 
um, you know, I move them routinely in surgery. When we put them on the operating room table and we get our x-ray, sometimes it's dislocated. And, and under live x-ray, we move their head to get it lined up. And I never see changes. I mean, I just, I find this a very safe surgery. So I don't typically monitor my odontoid fractures. I just don't. Now, in cases where the cord's compressed, for instance, uh, rheumatoid arthritis patients, rheumatoid patients get these huge arthritic complexes at C2 that push on the spinal cord. Those aren't trauma. Those are very important to monitor because your spinal cord is very compressed. But a fracture, I don't typically monitor. Um, and then prone positioning. So when we flip a patient down, face down, for surgery on the back of the neck, um, it's very hard. In the old days, we used to keep them awake. And then we would move them on the table. And then we put them to sleep. But when you put them face down, you can't do that. You can't position them awake and then put the, intubate them with face, facing the floor. So you have to put them to sleep before you flip them. And so you have no idea with these unstable fractures that are moving when you position them, if you need to put them in more flexion, more extension, if you're pushing on the spinal cord or not. So extremely important with unstable fractures. In the United States, in our country, I don't know anybody that would do a real mobile fracture without monitoring before they even when they before they even you know put the patient on the table. Okay, next. Oh, that's it. So um, I wanted, you know, we we're supposed to do this together so Bob could have some comments. Um, Dr. Sklobasi has done this for about 30 years and uh, knows He's worked with so many surgeons because uh, he worked at a training program where we had a lot of people come through. So I kind of, I'd like to have some of his comments on some of the different surgeons have different ideas on monitoring. Um, we were talking at, uh, last night um, about uh, some of the doc doctors we know, he knows and I know, and, and how they monitor, and some monitor everything they do and some don't like to monitor anything and then you have people all in between um, are you guys finding your doctors doing much monitoring for spine or is it mostly for the cranial the brain cases no this beers you monitor spine yes. no. every spine or just some um, just like uh, these kinds okay only severe severe And does you already, do you guys monitor many spine cases here? Not much. Any spine cases? Some cordomas? Intermedular tumors. 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 What about, do you do much trauma here? Fractures, compression? Not, not much. Not acute fracture. You don't do many here. You're not trauma hospital. Yeah. Uh, how, how about vertebral body fractures like metastasis to the spine? Or, Cordomas, things like that. Yeah. <laughs> I did a cordoma with him last year when I was here, and he would monitor that one. Um, I'm trying to think what else I can tell you. Do you have any questions? You may I ask you? Uh, you've told us <clears throat> the question is about uh, the intermediary uh, tumors. You've told us that uh, there is uh, a few ways for you, uh, th the first one, to stop or to change something, mm -hmm. um, to influence uh, the approach or something like that. What is the best, uh, what is the most important modality for you, exactly, for you to uh, make all these things uh, happen? Uh, so, actually, in intramedullary tumors, uh, the SCPs are more important because you're always doing those from behind. So you're, I mean, you, we don't do those from the front. So you're always going through the dorsal columns and you try to split them in the middle and, and it, it's, it's, they're very delicate cases. So SCPs are far more important with intramedullary tumors uh, because you're going through this, the back of the cord. But we monitor both the motors and the SCPs. What you can alter with, with intramedullary tumors is 
they're often, the low grade ones especially, often have a little bit of a plane where you can see the difference between normal spinal cord and tumor. But there are areas where you lose that distinction, where you're not sure what's tumor and what's normal spine. And the spinal cord is about as big around as your finger. I mean, it's small. And you're inside there, and, and, and everything's packed in that little area. So if you just get off a little bit, a millimeter or two, into normal cord, um, that's where you start to lose. So it can guide you. So one thing that's important is you start to see changes. You're like, you know, I, I might be getting out of the tumor here a little bit. So it can help that way. Retraction, like when you're in tumor surgery, you'll, depending on the type of tumor and, and its consistency, some of them you suction out, some you kind of pull out. And if it's one that's firm and you can grab it, you usually start on one end or one place where you have a nice, where you can see tumor and spinal cord and you work and you, you, you or an assistant kind of pulls gently while you dissect. And so if you pull just even a little too hard, your, your Bob might say you get losing some changes. So you can not, not pull at all, not traction. You can then start, maybe start on the, maybe you're working from below, you leave that and you work on the top. You see, so with spinal cord tumors, you can kind of change a little bit how you're doing it, okay? And it can guide you. But I find for tumors, SCPs uh, are, are much more helpful because you're coming right through the back of the spinal cord. Uh, and uh, when uh, the case is uh, you can't uh, differ the edge uh, from the, uh, for instance, um, Acetoma and uh, the tissue, the normal tissue, uh, you exactly the same approach uh, use uh, SCCP or uh, uh, ultrasound or uh, uh, ultrasound can be helpful too. It's they're together, used together. What is the more important approach from mm. your uh, just judgment? It becomes judgment. I mean, at some point, you have to decide. At, at, at early in the case, we will send a piece down to pathology so we have at least a preliminary idea of what we're working with. Myopsy. Yes. And that, and that, that, see, these are all factors because depending on what it is, then you kind of know what the outcomes are, okay? If you get more of it out, less of it out, can we radiate it, can we not radiate it? What's, what's the long-term behavior of this kind of tumor? That plays a role. And how aggressive you want to be. But also, the, excuse me, interoperative uh, biopsy. I don't know how it is in your uh, hospitals, mm -hmm. but in our country at all, I think uh, it's a very preliminary. It is. And sometimes, yes. It's very dependent on who who your pathologist is, and uh, even at one hospital, which one is on working that day. Um, I have some pathologists that I don't, I wouldn't ever depend on. They're very good with the final, with all their special stains, but in a frozen, we call it a frozen or a touch prep, they're not so good. And then we had, at Pittsburgh, we had one, uh, Julio Martinez, excellent. I mean, I, he was very good with the prelim. <coughs> so that, this, this is where I, there's no right or wrong answers. Every case is so different based on the tumor. Even who the doctor is telling you the pathology makes a difference. Uh, and we all know as surgeons who we trust more and who we don't trust more. So those all make a difference. And I don't know how it is here with your pathologist. Um, the big, big medical centers have neuropathologists. That's all they do is neuro. The smaller, medium hospitals, you just get a general pathologist that does the whole body. And so those make a difference too. And then um, this technology, interoperative monitoring, um, like I said, it could be very paralyzing to the surgeon if you're not prepared for it. Um, you have to not let it bother you when you see a change. I mean, it has to, you have to process it. You have to make a decision. But you can't let it make you so nervous that you, you can't finish the operation or do the operation correctly. You have to use the monitoring to guide you, but not let it frighten you. You know, it's a great tool, a great tool, but it can be very disruptive to a surgery if you're not, 
if you don't if you can't put it in its proper perspective and understand what what the limitations are to it. I mean, I've had cases where we've had drastic changes, and the patient was fine when they wake up. You know, we've all seen that. It's not 100% specific. That's why I said yesterday, it's very sensitive. It picks up all kinds of little things, but they don't always mean something to the patient. They don't always mean that the leg's not going to work. It doesn't mean you ignore them, but you have to put all this in your head while you're working and understand. And, and, and some changes are more important. You know, if your amplitude's going down, uh, you know, in the spinal cord, that sometimes is more important than a delay, you know, where it's slowing a little bit. Whereas hearing, you know, slowing to me sometimes is a big deal when you get over one millisecond. So you've got to kind of, you got to kind of know, got to know what, the, what, what it means to you. In the spinal cord, if you've not completely lost, if you've not really dropped off, usually you're going to be okay unless you've really, really lost a lot of your signal. And someone else had a question? Yeah, in the case when you make the scoliosis correction, if you lose signal, so something happens, would you prefer to still wake uh, the patient up to perform the stagnant yeah. wake-up test, or just wait a little bit, then to perform, uh, uh, you know? Well, first thing we do is, is take some of the distraction off. Of yeah, and, and just and see what, what recovers. And, mm -hmm. And maybe do it a couple times and see if it's a reproducible change. And, and then, and then this is where the neurophysiologist is very helpful. Is you know, is this a real change? Is this is this is this a severe change? I mean, is it just a little bit of a change, or are we really like losing signals? Um, if you're really losing signal, we will stop and, and wake the patient up, or um, you know, talk to the family, make a decision about what we need to do. Maybe we'll partially correct. So, so I mentioned these new rods because we have this ability now to, to not correct them all at once. But, um, you know, uh, sometimes we do staged corrections. You correct them part way and you let them grow a little more and get their body get used to it, and then you go back and you correct them further. So I don't do scoliosis surgery in my practice. Um, so, I, you know, the, the subtleties of that I'm not as familiar with. But I know, I know it's very helpful. You, you, you over-distract a spine and, um, you know, I've seen this with trauma. I've seen uh, two patients in one particular area near me, a, cer a certain surgeon who tended to over-distract, like they have a burst fracture. Mm -hmm. and, and she would put in a cage that was way larger, and she had a couple of paraplegics from over the These aren't scoliosis cases. These are patients that were in trauma. They were intact before surgery. Everything was working. And then she just really distracted them, put in a bigger cage than it should have been put in, and uh, they were paralyzed. So, A, monitoring would have been helpful. She didn't monitor those. But B, it's, it just shows sometimes when you, when you distract too much, it, it's going to hurt the spinal cord. And in cases of uh, spondylolisthesis, I don't know if you do a reduction or yeah. what, what's your approach in the US, but, but because not every surgeon performs a reduction, some, some just... Lumbar? Yeah. I, L yeah, I, I monitor my spondy, spondylolisthesis in America for one reason only. It's not the reduction. There's, I don't think there's a big risk there. It's the roots. You know, the spinal cord ends at L1, so it's, it's a root yeah. issue. Okay. Spontaneous yeah. EMG. I monitor for screw placement. It's not so much the reduction, because by the time when you reduce a spondy, you've decompressed everything. Before you pull them back, usually I've done, I've decompressed, the way I do it anyway, I decompress all the nerves and then I reduce them. So there's not a big risk there. But I do it for screw placement for legal reasons, for, for, for lawsuits. Only reason. I don't think that's a very risky procedure. We use now um, the interoperative CT scan, and I realize you don't have that everywhere, but the stealth system, um, and I did all of them for 15 years without it, and now, again, for legal reasons, I just use it. It adds 20 minutes to the surgery, we get a CT scan with the image guidance, you know, right where your screws are going, and then at the end of the case, we do another scan, and you can see that they're perfect. With the new scanning we have in the operating room, there's very little use for monitoring for those cases because it's so accurate your screw placement. Um, so I don't for I don't for uh, reducing spondies. Now whether you should reduce 
lumbar spondies, that's a, yeah, that's a big debate. We do them, we mostly reduce them in the U.S. Um, there's some really good articles in the older population, 60, 70 year old patients with degenerative spondies. There's some very good data that suggests all you need to do is decompress. You don't need to fixate them. Um, so in the older patients, I think there is a big debate whether you need to reduce them. But for the purposes of this conference, monitoring them, I, 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 most neurosurgeons in the U.S. don't monitor for spondylolisthesis. Yeah, and if they do, it's usually because they're putting screws in and they just want to touch the screws and make sure there's no screw hitting, touching a nerve. Question? Um, what are your potentials and um, what um, common criteria do you use? Um, do you think there's an indicator of empathy for all uh, the absence? Or what? Absence. Absence. Oh, absence. You, you know, I, they're so rare, and most of ours go down to endovascular, so I'm not usually. Bob would know, and that's a really good question for Bob, because he, he does all this monitoring for all the surgeons, but we get kind of specialized. That's very specialized surgery, extremely rare. I've diagnosed three of those in a decade, <laughs> and I send them to the guys that put the catheters in, because I don't do that. Let's ask Bob that, what, because that's very good. I don't know the answer to that. I know for, you know, I, I trained at Pittsburgh where we did, you know, 15 or 20 of these every week behind the ear, so I, I know a lot about BSERs <laughs> and a lot about general spine, but I don't, I don't know the criteria. I don't know if it's, uh, you know, and with vascular, I can say this, I do know with vascular uh, insults to the cord, it's all or none. It's when it goes, it goes. It's not like you're losing fun. It's, it's not like traction, pressure, it's out. It's working one minute and the next minute it's out. Um, and I think, I, I know, because we'll, we'll talk a little about brain, vascular in the brain, it's very helpful when you're doing aneurysm surgery or carotid surgery because you can put a temporary clip and see what happens with your monitoring. This, and I don't do the spinal cord work, but I imagine that when you're going to go in and you're going to embolize, if you temporarily occlude, same thing. I. I'll, we'll ask Bob, but my guess is they're going to go out. When you block it, they go out. It's not going to be, oh, you're starting to get some changes. Um, I think the benefit with spinal AVMs is probably that you can test. You block it, you see they're gone, you open it, it comes back. Um, the problem with temporary occlusion is the length of time you occlude it. So when you see them go, you've got to open it up. And, and they should recover. That's how it is in... Uh, in the brain, you know, they go out pretty quick. When, when you get an end vessel with no collaterals and you put a temporary clip on, it's, you know, it's pretty quick. You start to lose them and then they just go. And then you open the vessel and, and it comes back. It's the length of time. But my guess is it's going to be a pretty much absence. So, you do many? Have you seen many? Um, about 10. Yeah. In how many years? Yeah, and see, you, you, we talk, you refer from, what, three to four million people around that come to your hospital? Yeah. So that's ten in three years for three or four million people. And see, in Europe, you're one cent where you're at, you're one center. You know, you have a place like Petersburg or Moscow, and you've got multiple neurocenters. So even there's a lot of people here, you know, they end up at different hospitals, and so each hospital will see three or four. But you're the only big, I assume, you're the only big neurosurgery center f for the area. Yeah, so you get all of them, yeah. So the guy, the guy in America that does that is named Dan Barrow in Atlanta, Georgia, and he's got a series of 60 or 80 of those for his career. And he's the one that gave us, he came to Pittsburgh and gave us a lecture because he he did so many, that was his big specialty. And he he only did, you know, 60 or 70, and he got, people came to him from all over the world. 
uh, back to spinal uh, tumors, uh, uh, would you recommend when you uh, lose uh, signals uh, through your surgery uh, some kind of um, conservative methods, uh, well, high dose steroids yeah, yeah, or yeah, something yeah. like that? Yeah, I mean, the other thing, yeah, increase the blood pressure. I, you know, I when How I start. Much? When I start to lose signal, I talk to my anesthesiologist. The first thing I want to know, are, are they running low? Some anesthesiologists, they're perfectly happy with someone's systolic blood pressure at 80 because they're asleep, they're, their anesthesia's on, and they just think that's all fine, and it probably is for the heart and everything, but we're working on the spine or the brain, and we're pushing on vessels. That's so bad anesthesiologists. I'm just telling, you know, you know how it goes. They, they just kind of go on their what a typical case for a gallbladder. You know, they're just putting someone to sleep. They're not thinking like we do. So first thing I ask is what's their pressure? And if it's, if it's low, below 100, I, the first thing I'm like is get them back into the normal range. Um, I, I don't make them hypertensive. My big concern mm -hmm. with blood pressure is that the anesthesiologist is letting them run low. Not above 120, yeah? Yeah, 120 is fine. Yeah, I don't, you, I, you don't want to push it because then you get more bleeding in the OR. I just want to make sure they're not low, mm -hmm. okay? I don't necessarily want to make them high. I want them normal or a little above normal. Mm -hmm. That's one thing you can do. You can uh, give steroids for swelling, okay? How much? Ten, we, I use Decadron, dexamethasone, 10 milligrams. 10 milligrams. Just one-time dose, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you can use Dex... You can use... Uh, uh, any, any, any kind, Medra, yeah, you can use anything you want, but just a nice high dose of that. Um, you know, some some doctors will cool the patients, make sure they're cool. I don't know that there's good data that you know making someone cool helps, but um, cool or flush your sur uh, surgical area with uh, hot, uh, warm uh, fluids. No, we don't use. I don't use warm fluids. I think. Uh, I think keeping nerve, nervous tissue cool is. Uh, my opinion is it's probably better than making it warm. You know? Certainly in the brain with seizures, you know, you can shut a seizure down with cold water, in the OR. Just squirt it on the brain and the seizure will stop. So it it, it slows down brain metabolism. Mm -hmm. That's there's not really good. There's not really good data like prospective, really solid studies that say cooling. You know, we, we did a trial, uh, Pittsburgh was one of the big centers about 20 years ago when I was there on trauma, brain trauma and cooling patients and it didn't show a benefit. But then we know, for instance, that um, drowning victims in cold lakes mm -hmm. can be underwater for an hour and they revive well. In, a war, in the summertime, they, they don't. They're brain dead. So, you know, we also know with epilepsy surgery, if you get st status in the OR and you squirt cold water on, it'll shut the seizure off. So I think we know that cold environments slow brain metabolism. And so um, if someone's getting either brain or spinal cord, if they're having changes, uh, one thing you use is just make sure they're cool. I, think it, I mean, these are just little things we do. But How much cool? <laughs> cold, cold irrigation, turn the temperature down in the room, you know. In, in, in the United States, um, I don't know how it is here, there, there is so much centralized uh, government direction of how we do things. They tell us. So we have, a, a, we have something called JACO, Joint Accreditation of Hospitals. And they go around to hospitals every two years and they stamp, you're, you're a good hospital. And to do that, they, every year they come up with new ideas that they think some group of people decide are best. And, and so the last 10 years in the operating room, there's been this, when I trained in the 90s in neuro, Everything was cool. The rooms were cool. We, want, we didn't want the patients warm. We weren't trying to make them really cold, but we, didn't, we wanted them more cool than warm, okay? Mm -hmm. We didn't want them hyperthermic. We weren't pushing them down like 35 or 34, but you know, 36, keep them cool. About 10, 15 years ago, this committee that goes around, they, they all say, you know, the best thing now for surgery... But they normal thing. Yeah, no, normal. They don't think of the brain. They're just thinking of gallbladders and uh, belly surgery and orthopedic surgery. Plus track. Yes. They're just thinking 
general principles. So, you know, belly surgery with all the momentum and everything open, they, they get cool very fast. And anesthesia literature suggests that that's not a good thing for a lot of reasons. Um, but for spine and brain, we've always thought it's a good thing. And so now everybody warms, every patient I have, it, it drives me crazy. They all come in and they put these warming things. They're, they're warming all of my patients. And when I trained, we, we didn't, not, not only did we warm them, we actually, we had cooling blankets on them. So we went from cooling everybody and now they want to warm everybody. Even for a 20-minute carpal tunnel, they've got these blankets on them. This is crazy. We're, they're not going to get cold in 20 minutes with blankets. Uh, you know, we're not, we don't have their bowels open. But it's because this, you know, it's policy. It's mm -hmm. policy. Mm -hmm. And the way, in, the way we track policy in America are little check boxes. And mm -hmm. So if it's an easy thing to track, it gets tracked. So uh, antibiotics before surgery. They track that. They, everybody has to get an antibiotic, and that's good, but it's something really easy to, to give num to get a percent and say you're 98% good. This is one of those things. Everybody gets a warming blanket, they can check their box. Got mm -hmm. a warming blanket. Mm -hmm. And yet, it's not the best thing for every patient. It might be good for most patients for most surgeries, but I don't think it's the right thing for brain and spine surgery. So I only mention it because um, one thing you can do if you're getting changes is cool. I think cooling probably slows metabolism, maybe helps, maybe, maybe, but there's not good science. So you can use conservative measures. You can use steroids. You can make sure the blood pressure is good. Um, you know, there's there's not a whole lot of conservative measures you can do. Oxygenation, you know, there's that should make sure the oxygen's good, but very few times in the operating room is oxygen a problem because they've got the mechanical ventilation. Going, so well, we had a cases when we used uh, the saline with the room temperature mm -hmm. and uh, MEPS, they uh, were totally absent after this. After you yeah, yeah. yeah, and that's why we now we use the only warm uh, salines because uh, also the blood pressure drops uh, suddenly. And yeah. uh, we had a few cases like this. Uh, that's why we started to use only warm salines. Yeah. Why? I don't know. Well, and you think about it. <clears throat> is it hurting the, for instance, epilepsy surgery, you know, when you squirt it and it, you know, it shuts the signals down, is that harming the patient? That, that's a physiologic shutdown of the nerves as opposed to traumatic or injury. So it's like barbiturates. If you give someone barbiturates and you put them in a coma and you flat, flatline everything, have you harmed the nerve system? No. So I don't know that losing your MEPS, I mean, you, lo you lose a tool because now you can't see them. So in that function, the cold water maybe hurt you because you can't, you lost your monitoring ability. But I don't think you hurt the patient. Does that, mm -hmm. I don't think it's harmful to the patient. So one thing you can do is if you're getting changes is you can use something cold. But if it's going to take away your signals, then you lose your monitoring. So, so that's a good point, yeah. But I don't think using cold saline necessarily hurts long term. I think it shuts nerves down. Yeah. Tem temporary. Yeah, temporary. Yeah. I mean, we hurt patients because we're manipulating, we're cutting, we're coagulating, we're pulling, we're tugging, things like that. Can I make a comment? Mm -hmm. One question? Uh, going back to uh, spinal AVMs, uh, today Professor Yuri Shulov consulted a young ma male patient, 21 years old, uh, with a spinal cervical AVM, mm -hmm. and he was sent to endovascular surgery. So we quite, very rarely we meet these yeah. patients, and if we uh, see these cases, we um, direct them to endovascular Absolutely. surgery. Yeah. And there's a role for open surgery for certain types but most of them can be treated that way. It's, you know, as a neurosurgeon, it's one of those cases that you don't want to miss because they're so rare, and you see someone with myelopathy where they're just not walking right. They get, they get an engorged spinal cord, so they get, they get edema around the lesion because, um, because of the blood flow. And so you could have these patients come in and they get these MRI scans because they're myelopathic and they're not walking well and you don't even think about an ABM because it's so rare 
and you just see some little flow void, some little signal, it looks like, well, that's kind of a big vessel. You don't, not all of them are well seen on MRI, only the real big ones. The little single fistulas, you might see one large draining vein. If you're not thinking about it, you miss it. Um, so someone who's progressing to losing function over weeks or months, um, and you have no explanation, it's something you just need to make sure you think about because you can miss them. And I wanted to ask a question about uh, the necessity of interoperative neuromode monitoring in case of carry malformation. I don't Do you use it? Right now. Okay. That's a very safe surgery. It's, you're not really doing anything on the spinal cord. You're just opening the dura and giving the brain more room. Um, I think it's unnecessary. We, we never monitored those. We had lots of monitoring going on. Yeah. Do you guys monitor those yeah. KRs? No. Yeah. No. Okay, now we uh, plan to have a coffee break. No, that'd be perfect. Yeah, we can. Bob, come back. I can't carry the